Just hanging out in chat. Hey, it's the great Rafiki. You know, the great Rafiki is the greatest of the Rafikis. Awfully jaunty, says Stan X. Hey, Duke, good to see you. Glad you're all here. It's going to be a fun program. Um, because we have a guest. It is one of my favorite guests, one of yours, because you tell me about it all the time. And by you, I mean chat. And uh, I've been thinking about, you know, how, what is a good way to introduce a man of this caliber? Um, I think, well, let me just show you. <laughs> well, look who it is. It's Malcolm Shepard. The gag is that he knows I dislike that. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. How's it going? Oh, it's so fun. Um, I love it. I was going to try to embellish that a little bit more, but I just, I, I watched it and I was like, how can you improve upon perfection? Mm. <laughs> That's a quote for the books. Hmm. Uh, Malcolm, thank you for joining us today. You know, so it is, um, that's kind of a big deal. Um, this week we, um, announced the print pre-orders for Cthulhu Awakens. That's right. And a whole deal. Basically, if you pre-order the print book, you can immediately pay five bucks, just five more dollars and get the whole PDF. This is true. From page one, from cover to cover. And we're and we're done, right? I mean, it's it's complete. It is pretty much, yeah. yeah, yeah. I guess so. I I've been so used to it being an intermediary stage for so long that uh, that I don't actually want to admit it's finished. But <laughs> right, right. You know, you know it is finished. Have, yeah, someone should have to find a typo. You know, keep it to yourself. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll update it and all that. But yeah, I'm very very excited about it. Um, let's see. Reading Eight said, "Picked up Cthulhu Awakens yesterday. Looking forward to reading it." Nice. Uh, Duke's calling me a tease, uh, and also says, "Hi, Malcolm, the Lightning Man." Um, we've got Stanix here. Uh, <laughs> reading said, "Reading it says, damn, that's an entrance." He makes me do that. Um, yeah, Duke's uh, just mentioning, you know, sort of our audio at the beginning. It self-regulates. I don't know why, and we're working with Streamer to, to figure out what's going on there, but mm -hmm. uh, we'll figure it out for sure. Um, but, uh, okay, so uh, it, the PDF is out there. We, um, we got it out to our, uh, our, our buddies, our kind of early look pals uh, on, that, on that special early look list. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, that's when it went out to – that's when we sent the preview out to backers. That's right. That's right. And um, okay. folks um, love it. Uh, rave reviews. Um, lots of questions, lots of interesting ideas and thoughts. Um, but, you know, as if you're if you're describing this to somebody who uh, you're encouraging, you, you think that they're going to enjoy this. What are the what are the pieces that appeal to you? And uh, and talk a little bit about the, the making of that. Um, well, it is a role playing game that was completed. <laughs> no. Uh, okay, so basically, one of the things that uh, a lot of Mythos games do is they kind of pretend that no other Mythos game exists, right? Um, but, you know, we, we know the other games are out there, and so one of the things I wanted to do was to provide a different experience, right? So, you know... Um, I didn't want to do a thing where someone was essentially attempting to improve on Call of Cthulhu, right? So instead of going for literary homage and and a focus on one period, we decided to stretch it out to sort of the hundred years between the original Lovecraft story and the present day, right? That's what we call the weird century. And to support play throughout that period. So that was one of them. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I wanted to do. And the other was instead like to sort of 
talk about the contrast with the homage approach. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do was not really treat those works as something that we're going to emulate directly in play, but really to see how we would take the Cthulhu mythos and turn it into a game setting, into a setting designed for role playing, right? So yeah. there are a few considerations there. Like one of it is, of course, you know, we have we have no truck with uh, with Lovecraft's personal politics. So the yeah. assumption there is, whenever you read a mythos story, uh, you have to remember that from the perspective of Cthulhu Awakens, uh, that is one person's perspective and they it's all propaganda right like kind of it's proper yeah there's a prop there's a, there's a certain subjectivity and propaganda interest right um so you know it's when you know one of the offensive things that lovecraft liked to talk about was like you know degenerate peoples right so yeah you know because and, you know those happen to be people who weren't white or were poor right according to lovecraft yeah. so you know obviously we threw that out and so you can assume any story chronicling that kind of thing is a deception uh, of some kind. So, right. so we did a lot of work to um, make a lot of elements of the mythos a little more subjective, too, so that you can make what you will of it, right? Ooh, I like that. So you kind of broaden it a bit so that people yeah. can kind of create their own space yeah. in that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and in addition to that, you know, uh, we don't really put you on strict rails in terms of what kind of stories you want to tell. Like, you can support action adventure with Cthulhu Awakens. I just wouldn't recommend it against, you know, most of the mythos creatures that are in there because yeah. they will eat you or <laughs> eat your mind or something right. like yeah. that. Yeah. So, yeah. you know. Um, but we wanted room so that, you know, if you wanted to run uh, an action oriented shoot 'em up game or a an espionage game or anything like that, we provide support for those things. Okay, great. All right. So uh, now talk to me about Cthulhu Awakens as a as an, an additive to something else. Like is there are there aspects of Cthulhu Awakens that fit nicely with, say, other age games or or oh, even yeah. games outside of our library? Well, I mean, it's an age, you know, it's an age RPG. And because it's an age RPG, it means that conversion takes like five, like eyeballing and five minutes of thought, maybe five minutes of thought, right? Like I know I've taken things from Dragon Age and run them in modern age just by grabbing the Dragon Age book and right. going, well, if this ability score doesn't exist, I'll use this one instead. Just doing it on the fly. You can easily do that with Cthulhu Awakens. So all of the creatures could be used with, Fantasy Age Second Edition. Uh, one of the things is that uh, we have fortune as an optional rule. So generally, the because Fantasy Age has a more heroic take on the age system, you would want to use the fortune scores for health for any of the monsters you take from Cthulhu Awakens, right? Similarly, there's a lot that can be ported directly into Modern Age. There's some differences in character creation, but they are there's enough similarity that you can port um, you can port professions and backgrounds between them without too much trouble. Modern ages backgrounds and professions are a little more restrictive than Cthulhu Awakens. Is. So okay. you All can right. just pick which one you would you would pick which one you would want and apply it in character creation. Uh, similarly, all of the Eldritch workings, right, are spells, and the and Cthulhu Awakens approach to psychic powers also could be ported to modern age pretty much directly, and fantasy age too, for that matter. Uh, you would just have to change some of the focuses involved, right? Because one of the our approach to mythos magic uh, is to sort of treat it as something that is mostly incomprehensible but uh the idea is that you are you take a faith-based path or an occult path or a scientific path or some other metaphysical uh, path to the limit of human understanding and then you take that little step beyond right so yeah. we represent that by having uh some workings require 
science-based focuses. So in a game like Fantasy Age, you're not going to have, you know, a physics focus, right? In the way that you're going to have it in uh, in Modern Age of Cthulhu Awakens. Gotcha. Do we okay. have a physics focus? I'll say chemistry. I think chemistry is one we definitely have. Okay. Yeah, Just that works. to see how much I know about my game, eh? Now, Stanix uh, bring, uh, mentions this. Stan talks about um, that, that cultists are there to fight and the mythos creatures are hazardous terrain. Is that kind of a good way to think <laughs> about that, how that well, works? I mean, they can work as just plain monsters, too, okay. right? Okay. Um, but, you know, one of the things in Cthulhu Awakens is that our default assumption is that you never get any tougher as you go up in level direct you never really get that much tougher as you go up in level um so whereas the monsters are not scaled for that right the wow. monsters are scaled for if you use fortune as an optional rule which is supported in cthulhu awakens um or if you're running say fantasy age with health um the monsters are pretty are more scaled to something like that right in terms of traditional heroic you know back and forth fighting Otherwise, they're kind of designed so that, you know, you can sometimes drive them back, but a lot of the time they show up, you fight them, they do something horrible to you, and then you run, right? Oh, and you make some alienation tests to see uh, exactly how the experience worked out for your, your mind. You know, interestingly enough, the way that you describe that is a lot like my relationship with chat. <laughs> just kidding um okay so uh now if i'm recalling and i just uh closed this i'm gonna open it up and we'll, we'll look at the pdf here in a second but mm -hmm. is the did you add some uh uh didn't you borrow some relationships uh some mechanisms from um blue rose is that correct am i making yeah that that's, up? that's right i mean one of the things that i uh one of the things I really like that was designed before my my time um, working on age was uh, was relationships uh, from Blue Rose. Uh, I know that they were designed. They first appeared in Blue Rose. I know that they originally conceived of for Dragon Age, and then I borrowed them and expanded them a bit for Modern Age. Um, but then I started, but when I was working in Modern Age, I was looking at, you know, well, this is a great mechanic. Uh, it's very, you know, some mecha game mechanics are kind of elemental, right? They look like they were always there and always should have been there because they're so straightforward, right? And I feel like, like relationships and bonds are like that, right? Because the mechanic is you draw on it, uh, you get sun points, right? So it's easy, right? Uh, <laughs> But it, it kind of feels like it's something that should have been in every age game because it is so direct. Uh, so I took that and I expanded it to include things like your connections to organizations, personal ideologies, you know, codes of honor, codes of conduct that you believe in, and uh, expanded it into a general thing called bonds, which represent your emotional connections to things. Um, and also uh, kind of split them into personal bonds, which are things that you make the choice to draw on, right? So, you know, your your best buddy is in trouble, so you can draw upon your bond with your best buddy, right? But we also have external bonds, which are bonds that can be used aversively or uh, without the player drawing on them. So that's things like, you know, um, dad said you'd never amount to anything, right? Is the kind of, you know, bond that you're not going to draw on as a character, but you might take for yourself for role-playing purposes. And then what the GM can do is that, well, you know, you are, uh, you know, you're having a conflict with this guy who reminds me of your dad and, you know, your dad really got in your head. So, you know, I'm going to spend these points on stunts for the antagonist, right? I um, did. Okay. okay, I get it. Yeah. So we have a, 
you know, we take a pretty, you know, we only touch on that lightly because that is something where, you know, of course, like consent is going to be a big part of that, right? You're going to choose the bond as the player and you're giving it to the GM and saying you have permission to, you know, to exercise this, right? But we really only mandate it um, if you have a wealthy background in the game for now. And that's just as a balancing mechanism. And that's also to just give you, you know, if you are, if you're a wealthy character, right? It, it The package comes with a little, you know, dynastic angst, ah, if you will. It. Because yeah. that kind of it kind of it kind of fits the genre. Um, a lot of the uh, talents and specializations we have are really are really designed for genre focus. That's another big thing. Um, is back in the Modern Age Companion, we talked about having Grandmaster and Apex degrees of talents and specializations. In Cthulhu Awakens, we implement that, uh, but only for specializations. The idea is to make specializations extra special, right? Um, and because, you know, a game from a genre that tends to focus on people's obsessions, right? You want to provide a path for someone, you know, who wants to become, you know, the greatest scholar of the supernatural, right? Or things or something like that. So the idea is that, uh, is that you have these five degree specializations in addition to your three degree talents. And our selections have been like, we didn't just reproduce the modern age uh, set, um, but we took ones that, this was something where um, uh, Khaloon Khalil uh, did some great work in picking out the types of talents that would fit in a mythos game. So, you know, we have one called Hard Case, which is really, you know, more about the the fictional vibe of the earlier period where, you know, if you want to play uh, a tough guy, right, you take that, you take a, you have a hardened talent for that. However, we also have a talent which indicates that you own a spooky mansion. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, we have a talent that means that symbolizes, well, one of your ancestors wasn't quite human. Uh -huh. And you can manifest things, you know, like natural weapons and the ability to soothe mythos creatures and things like that. What are the neat things actually that happened in uh, in sort of the last third of development is that our, uh, you know, our VTT master, Jonesy, uh, he wanted to run a game where the uh, players were ghouls, right? And, you know, we had... We had some stats for ghouls, but I was like, well, you know, if he's making that demand, then I have to change the human legacy talent and change ghouls to support gradually transforming into a ghoul. So those were some systems that we added later on uh, because we got that feedback from play. So that was that was pretty neat. I love this cover. This is so great. Oh, the uh, yeah, that was. Uh, that was our cover prototype. We ended up uh, going with a different artist, but we used the design of that door. So that's kind of like one of the iconic features of the game is that weird door, which you'll see pop up in a few different places. And of course, we have some signature characters from modern age, uh, yeah. you know, uh, Sean and um, Amy. Nice. Yeah, I love it. I, this book is beautiful. Um, how how did a phenomenal job? Yes, he did. He did. But he did. It, of, art it popped. Oh this yeah. Is, yeah, it popped through a few different iterations, um, but we we sort of bounced around to the right place in the end. Nice. Uh, well, I so disagreed with some of the decisions Hal made, and I was wrong, <laughs> which is why. He has his job and I have my job um, <laughs> just to provide some context, like different companies do things, you know, do different things. Right. Um, and you, I've worked for some companies where the writer uh, writer or developer gets no input on what things look like. Um, 
but at green running, it tends to be a little more uh, a little more cooperative, where the developer um, does a pretty extensive set of art notes and gets to gets to sort of gets to be pretty strident in expressing what they want the game to look like, right? Uh, but you know, at the same time, we also are interacting with Hal and Kara who are, you know, the people who actually do the layout and, and know what they're doing. So yeah. in that kind of cooperative process, we end up producing something like this. Uh, I and I'm pretty I'm pretty chuffed with how, how it looks. Um, you, know. you know, I think that for and, a third page, if we were to do the bingo card, that we would have to have the word chuffed in there because uh, I do think you try to, you, you fit it in um, at least once, if maybe not oh, twice. Oh, do I? Oh, and I like it. I'm not. This is not a criticism. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good one. That's a real good one. It's um, uh, that's that's what having uh, that's what having a mother from England does. Is adds that word to your vocabulary. Right. Um, um, so let's get into some of the some of the other things that are in um, in this book, and also we want to touch on things that are to come for Cthulhu Awakens, because it's a standalone, it's its own thing. It's, yeah. it's got, uh, there's some plans in the work, uh, in the yeah. works. But, oh, I should, yeah. yeah, that's something to really clarify too, is because we kind of, originally Cthulhu Awakens was going to be a modern age supplement, but yeah. um, halfway through development, so around the time all the first drafts had been submitted, uh, we decided that we would spin it off into its own RPG. However, uh, a lot of people seem to think that it's a supplement for Modern Age or another age game, uh, and it is substantially compatible with it and can definitely act as a supplement, but it is its own full-blown yeah. RPG. You don't need anything else for it. Um, you know, so... Nice and some terror. Yeah, if you... Nice and some terror. If you are, you know... If your main focus is mythos RPGs instead of age, right? Don't worry that you have to buy a bunch of books. I mean, you should buy a bunch of books, but, but you don't have to worry about it. It was it was basically a book built to advertise every other book that we're making. I mean, it is it's <laughs> you know cover it, to cover of in a, in a number, <laughs> well, in some way, like we talk about compatibility with yeah. uh, with modern age, but um, and certainly this game could not exist without various design innovations that happen through other age games, especially with modern age, but also with fantasy age, second edition, right? Because fantasy age, second edition was in uh, kind of in mid process while we were working on this. So for example, one of the things that happened is that we changed the stunt selection um, in Cthulhu Awakens because uh, we kind of, we refined stunts in fantasy age, second edition enough that we didn't want this game to do without it. And that happened with a, num a couple of other things with Fantasy Age, second edition, where we came up with some things that we wanted to, you know, some improvements we wanted to add to the game. Um, and so what we did was we ported them over, right? And yeah. that was sort of a 0.5 development step is doing that. However, yeah. some of it went the, in the other direction too. Uh, there are some innovations in Fantasy Age Second that were originally put down for Cthulhu Awakens. Like one of those things is defeat conditions, where when you drop someone to zero health, uh, they don't just you know go into a coma, right? You right. can choose what you can choose what happens to them, right? So that was something that I originally devised for Cthulhu Awakens um, for the simple reason that you know. While, for the simple reason that some of the antagonists are so powerful <laughs> that, you know, knocking you into a coma all the time just stops being fun. And, <laughs> you know, and it doesn't emulate, you know, getting captured by monsters and taken to their yeah. lair and things like that. Well, uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. And, and, uh, but, and, well, should I mention this? Oh, yeah. There was a terrible 90s uh, Lovecraft-based uh, film anthology where the thing that grossed me out the most 
was a woman being knocked out by a monster and awakening in this like huge chamber full of corpse parts. And oh. I remember that just really, really got me. And I thought, you know what? I want to share that terrible experience I had. <laughs> so I created a game mechanic to make that happen. Um, okay, well can it called is it a very specific sort of um, you know <laughs> <laughs> no, it's no but seriously though you know that's why i originally did it but it ended up being like even more appropriate for fantasy age second right oh, okay. where okay. we're moving towards you know where fantasy age is really moving towards embracing a more swashbuckling play style right yeah. because we already have the stunt system and it's all you know it's already implicit in the game and you know our implied setting and everything else so you know so we have these kind of interactions with the different age lines uh quite a bit right yeah you know new engines uh uh says we agians are used to grabbing every age book in existence to have the full age experience um well yeah, yes but it doesn't have to work that way but we, we like it that you work yes. that way. yes <laughs> um uh, <laughs> what good is having a lair if you can't drag the heroes off to it yeah yes exactly. yeah. yeah i dig it well so I'm, I'm hanging out here at the at the esoterica lexicon and um i i there's a couple things that caught my eye uh, do you, is there uh, more that you kind of want to make sure that we cover before we dive into some of the nuts and bolts? No, not really. I mean, so but then again, who knows? I'm so, I am so familiar with this game now because I have read the book. Of course, I'm going to forget something immediately after saying this, but bear with me. Uh, <laughs> I, I have spent so much time working on this that I think it is difficult for me sometimes to remember what would not be the most obvious, you know, thing. Right, right. Because I've had to look at all the minutia uh, off and on and then, for about a year. But, but you know, what, what do you want to know? Um, well, first, I just want to say, like, you know, how do you do a thing to kind of cleanse your brain of the of the mode that you've been in for, you know, for a long period of time focusing on? Like, do you just sit around and just go hardcore Western or are you like, <laughs> are you watching like, Oh, you know, okay. like, oh, in terms of media consumption. Yeah. Generally I do all the media consumption at the start of a project. And I part see. of that is because it reassures me that even though I'm procrastinating, I'm getting something done. <laughs> right. Um, but part of it is I want to have a sense of what the sort of mass media perspective and what demands it kind of generates uh, in gamers, uh, but also just to have ideas and themes and things kind of floating around for me to grab uh, and kind of orient a game mechanic uh, or a bit of setting in, sure. in that direction. So yeah, mostly at the beginning. Uh, when, it's, when it's all done, um, well, I mean, for one thing, I have, you know, I, I, I have my Sunday game, um, which, you know, this will amuse you, Troy. Uh, I am playing in a modern age game. Um, I'm not running it, but it is a modern age game in the threefold setting. So all stuff I did, but I'm not. I'm the player, not the GM. Uh, but the funny thing is I made a first level character at random. Uh, I just wanted to totally follow where things went. And who did I end up making? The iconic that you uh, put up at the beginning of this, surrounded by fireworks. Really? So I am, in fact, yes, I accidentally made Sword Dad. Or <laughs> the this character's name is actually Andre, right? And oh, Andre yeah. was Andre was invented by uh, uh, Sean um, Ingham uh, because. Uh, as a blatant, like, you know, sort of like heroic version of me when they were writing a story. And yeah. I just happened to make that character randomly <laughs> by accident. And now I am 11 levels into this campaign that's, uh, that, you know, normally we do rerun it for a year and then we alternate with something else. So, so that's what I'm doing right now. And it helps clear my brain out. I like right. It. I like it. Uh, I, I remain unsurprised that you pulled Sword Dad. Um, absolutely. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> well, here's a question for you. So, well, I like his I like his youthful face compared to mine. 
<laughs> and he will look that way oh. forever. Uh, oh. Let's see. Nate says, oh, hello, yeah, friend. Sure. Uh, today. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hold on one second. Uh, Paul Shaw says, would you use this to launch different IPs the way you used Modern Age to uh, to do Lazarus, Threefold, Cyberpunk Slice? Um, probably not so much because there's a definite setting to it. Um, certainly, we've talked about uh, variations of it, right? One of the things, actually, was we... There's a bit called the demi uh, which are these alternate universes um, that you can reach. And we originally had a much more extensive section for them. Um, but unfortunately, as the game shaped up, we, you know, I got a pretty, I got a conceptually very strong, um, strong setting chapter from David Castro. And, you know, uh, there were so there were so many ideas in there that I thought, well, you know, I've got to add paragraphs to this because people will want to be part of that. Um, you know, the implicit cartography group. I got to add I got to add material to that, um, and uh, you know, and the investigative agency. Oh, I've got to add material to that because players can join it, or characters can mm -hmm. join it. So there were all these great ideas, and unfortunately. Uh, what fell to the wayside were these alternate universes, uh, which were done by um, uh, Sharang Biswas. And, oh, I'm doing that thing where I know their internet handle and oh, I've forgotten know? their actual name. If you take me to the cover page, I will know immediately who it is as soon as I see the cover. <laughs> I'm scrolling with fury. Yeah, um, scroll let's furiously. See. Yeah, take me to the credits. Take me to the there credits. Stop, stop. All right. Uh, Hold blah, on. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, Daniel Lauzon. Uh, Daniel okay. Lauzon. Yeah. So they did a nice uh, and non conventional section, right? Where they really focused on communities and sensory information. So it was like a little, it was a very intimate kind of set of settings. Um, that were integrated into the main setting, but unfortunately there just wasn't room or an elegant organizational way to present them in the detail that uh, that we were given. Yeah, the Carter West Agency, that was one of those things that you know yeah. I felt compelled to expand um, because of the work David Castro had done on it. So, you know, so, you know, there's a definite setting. Could you use the skeleton of it to do other things? Yeah, you certainly can. Uh, another thing that unfortunately we couldn't integrate as much as we wanted was back when the plan was to make it a supplement for modern age, um, we had um, Jack Norris do uh, considerations for uh, Lovecraftian fantasy, right? Uh, but unfortunately, it just didn't, it didn't, the, thematically, it didn't really shake out that we could add that appendix because once it turned into its own game, it seemed kind of out of place. So those are both things that we're hoping to do more stuff with. So, basically. yeah, yeah. And, so, and, uh, and so in short, what you're saying is there are, there are places to expand that, there are uh, definitely places to expand. It is a very large setting, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, because the idea is you have the weird century timeline going from the 20s to the present, right? A bunch of stuff happens in there, but we also have prehistory, right? Well, we have, you know, the history you know, and then we have the, you know, uh, prehistoric civilizations that are, that are straight out of the source material, where you have cities that were around, like, you know, 80,000 years ago. Um that so you know you could go back in time and add some stuff from fantasy age and run like a really neat uh pulp fantasy game right sure sure yeah i also I, I can't escape the uh the notion that this could uh cthulhu awakens could also add just a real cosmic horror vibe to um blue rose yeah you could do that if you use the alienation yeah. Uh, material. Uh, certainly there are some entry points to that stuff. I'm not the biggest Blue Rose sage. Um, 
right? Uh, but yeah, I do know, Gabe, you know, there's there's a bunch of stuff that could really be, you know, seasoned yeah. well with, uh, yeah, with yeah. some influence from from uh, Cthulhu Awakens. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things is that you'd have to sort of like the problem with the problem with cosmic horror is it's always easy to let cosmic horror kind of fall into what what are we going to call it? Sort of traditional moral horror, let's say. Right. Uh, okay. So, you know, and that is where we think of the mythos gods as evil and we think of their influence as corruption um, in in a moral sense. And the thing is, these are certainly like these are not totally divorced, divorced from cosmic horror, but you kind of have to tread a fine line. Right. Because yeah. you can't think of the outsiders, the mythos entities as evil, right? With a couple of exceptions. Um, they're just, you know, they're just, you're just not equipped to process them intellectually, perceptually, what have you, right? And so the idea of alienation is that uh, you have been exposed to these things which you are not really equipped to process yeah. Uh, and it creates problems for your mind, right? Uh, and your sense of self. So that's how we do that. Um, yeah. And it's easy to think of, it's it's easy to sort of accidentally confuse it with morality, right? But, you know, this is like, it's, we're, I guess this is less like you did a bad thing and these are the consequences, right? Uh, it's more like being poisoned, right? Yeah, so, yeah. you know, and while if someone poisons you, they're wrong, but the poison has no morality. I see. So, so right. do, yeah, and that, that is sort of an interesting, you know, when people talk about cosmic horror has such, it's a genre, it is a genre and people really uh, kind of vibe with it. Um, but it, it it is different than. So is the is the idea that Cthulhu is uh, is larger than we could even possibly comprehend, and that our yeah. world, you know, you know, and that this is the the impact of that gra the gravitational you know force of this uh, cosmic knowledge um, is is there that is the the stage and the space where you play out you know all of the adventures. Yeah, that that's that's the that is the thing that's a hazard, right? Now, where the moral dimension comes in is that we can make good and bad choices when we're exposed to this. And it's a source of power, right? Yeah. Um, so we can make moral decisions as far as that goes. But the actual tools, right, um, aren't especially moral. However, you know, like poisons and like firearms and like things like that, we can certainly ask why a thing is present, like what the moral reasons for its presence are, right? So you will have things where, you know, people do bad things and people do evil things and the mythos is tied up in it. But one of the things is that like one of, one of the touchstones and I, I've been, this has sort of come up in some past work is that like um, Cthulhu fundamentally doesn't care. Like if you sacrifice, an, if you sacrifice someone to Cthulhu, right? Cthulhu doesn't care that you did that it's a bad thing, right? Whatever yeah. transactional thing is happening is on the level of weird life force metaphysics or what have you, right? Yeah. It's yeah, it's yeah. no as far as Cthulhu, like it's no different than I wouldn't even say it's 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 no more moral than than you know eating because eating has a moral dimension. It's like trying to it's like trying to morally judge what enzymes are doing sure. with the food, okay, right? Okay, I feel, I feel am, I, am I making sense here? Or is this a little? I think I think the text makes it a little better than me talking about it. This is this is why I write instead of asking. What, what's interesting about Cthulhu, uh, the mythos, is that this is really what it, it's baked into the genre to question what the genre is and to try to define it in ways yeah, and to sort of. That's very true. And but, I think that that's one of the things I love about it. Yeah, but like I guess the main thing is that I want to emphasize that it's not like you know uh, if we look at 
you know, pop Satanism, right? From like, you know, traditional horror movies, right? Yeah. If you if you sacrifice somebody to the devil, right? The devil likes it because you're doing something bad, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're being right? corrupted by the devil, and that's what you're being corrupted. Yeah, uh, any corruption that happens because of the mythos is more like your hard drive, the hard drive that is your brain getting corrupted, right? Right, and not and not that, not that you corrupt. have yeah. decided to lead, decided to you know make immoral decisions, right? Right, right, right. Now, but and and now, as as you, morality plays a role when you start to talk about what people choose to do mm -hmm. now that they know, right? I mean, if, yeah. you know, if, you know, yeah, yeah. People who are are wanting to utilize or leverage what they know or what they think they know for more power, mm -hmm. for more influence, for riches and fame and that whole thing. Um, mm -hmm. But that's not they, they're not doing it because Cthulhu sent them a note and said, yeah. please. Yeah. 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 And and in the setting, this kind of upscales um, politically and socially too, because we have some conspiracies happening, right? And certainly, there's a moral there is a moral dimension to you know not telling the public that there's a part of Antarctica cordoned off because it's full of shoggoths, and if the shoggoths get exposed to modern technology, they'll imitate it and master it, and Basically, you don't want like you know, shape shifting super scientists who can turn their bodies into artillery. You know, and learning how to do that. Are you a part right? Particular. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know. So there's all the you know. So, but the question, you know, there's a question about why we would keep that a secret, right? Um, and it's the same within the setting. Of course, we have the you know. Uh, Janin, which is like the big, if I'm pronouncing it right, which I'm probably not, is, is the big underground cavern system that's under part of the United States, right? Uh, that is also kept a secret by the government in Cthulhu Awakens. Yeah, I don't yeah. know anything about it. I don't know anything about actual caverns. The United States government keeps. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Who knows? But probably. Yeah. Um, you know, okay, and so then we have. Sorry, go on. Oh, no, no, I was just going to say, I want to, so you touched on the, uh, the Demimons and, uh, mm -hmm. that was one of my questions. Um, but, uh, but got that. And so, uh, now I, we talked about, um, I'm just looking at my stuff here. Uh, tell me about the implicit cartography group. Um, that, that is a group of, um, intelligence analysts, um, and associated periphery. And their whole thing is that they received a number of documents uh, from the future and sort of formed around uh, collecting these documents and then also collecting um, eldritch artifacts and other mythos related things, right? And so they are an arm of the United States government that is hazily associated with the CIA. In, yeah, in Cthulhu yeah. Awakens, right? Um, we actually have an adventure set in the 1960s um, on the way that was written by uh, by Eminem's own uh, Alex Thomas, and uh, so that talks about the the ICG uh, in the 60s in more detail. That was fun because I had to research everything from the early CIA to what military issue Quonset huts looked like I and mean, up, you're already on so many lists because of what you'd search on the internet that yeah i mean go for it <laughs> yeah so yeah. and it, uh, yeah yeah um <laughs> so you know and another thing that is sort of part of the setting is yithian meddling because the yeah. uh the the yithians are these mythos aliens who uh who travel through time by possessing bodies, uh, the bodies of other organisms at different points of the timeline. And the idea is that they have an eventual plan to migrate from the distant past um, where they will be destroyed um, to the far future uh, into the body of a yet to evolve species. So to make all this happen, they have to make sure that the history of humanity plays out in a certain way and that the end of 
the, you know, and that the end of humanity happens in a certain way, right? Because they're rooting for the cockroaches, basically, because the cockroaches oh, will eventually okay. turn into whatever species that they possess, right? Or maybe not the cockroaches. I'm not an insect evolution specialist, but we get the, uh, yeah, the, the yeah. But analogy, yeah. So, analogy. so the so there are Yithians possessing human bodies throughout history, making sure that you know humanity does what it's supposed to historically. Right? A question about Yithians: so Do they come? Do, do they do they enter into the storyline as um, uh, as human? Or do they? Are there aspects of them that you know? You're like, whoa, that's a Yithian. Well, they're alien consciousnesses, but they, uh, you know, but they inhabit human bodies, right? Okay. Their alien minds are represented in a couple of ways. Like they have a focus called alien knowledge, which means you know, they're aliens who can go to the future, so they know everything. They know some stuff. Or they yeah. have essentially a version of every knowledge focus, right? Um, is just replaced with that. There's also a mechanic where uh, they can have an encounter and then leave notes for themselves uh, to be looked at in the far future and then sent back to them. Oh, okay. so a lot of a lot of Yithian agents will uh, in you know in later parts of the weird century they'll be wearing body cams, um, so that that data can get sent back to inform them in the present, right? Yeah. Which is a bit of a paradox, but you know, um, that's time um, travel for you. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. I and mean, that, that's, uh, yeah, yeah, that's- But cool. they're, they're, but it, it kind of represents the, th the theme too, because they're not out to destroy humanity or save humanity, but you know, their interests require doing both of these things, right? Right, um, um, yeah. right, yeah, yeah. Like they will, you know, they will help us keep Cthulhu from waking up next year, right? Sure. But maybe not like, maybe not 5,000, 50,000, 100,000 years down the road when they decide, well, you know, those roaches look like they got some real potential. We can just kick over humanity and, uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 shake and the start nest. developing the species that we eventually want to migrate into. Interesting. Okay, I like that. Okay, so all right, so they are they are essentially creating their next, you know, big jump or or yeah. a, a big jump in there. Yeah, I yes. like that. So tell me which the they meat also part. already taken, which they've already taken, and they're already passing notes. And stuff back and forth. Uh, Commando. Yeah, yeah. Is, it, it will um, overheat your brain a bit if you look at it too much. Uh, Commando says that also Yith can see nonlinear time. Yeah, they can kind of see time. Well, I mean, they inherently see time non-linearly because they jump around in time, right? Yeah, but yeah, they do yeah. have some limits, right? Um, like they can't double back on themselves. Oh, what do you mean? Like, they, like can't. they can't go like, well, I've learned, I've learned from my mistakes. I'll just repossess my body, my the um, human body I had in the past, and get it right. 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 So they get that one path through, and they don't. Get, they have get to it. have some. Well, the thing is, if they had, unless they have limitations, right? Yeah. Um, even if I have to hand wave some of them because time travel is just weird, uh, <laughs> like if they don't have those, then the setting loses some of its basic plausibility. And I'm not saying that you know. Here's the thing with game settings, right? There, if you put a microscope powerful enough on them, they're never, none of them are, will ever make sense, right? However, we're not trying to justify the existence of an entire alternate universe. We're trying to justify the existence of an artistic creation that we enjoy. That's so right. we play fast and loose with some of this stuff, right? Well, and the other thing as well is that we depend on the GM to help knit those stories together. If we do too much of the explaining, well, that doesn't that's true. Anything. Yeah, that's yeah. true. I mean, there are going to be ultimate truths about how things work that we don't want to, you know, be super, you know, adamant about. Um, the Yithian yeah, comment, yeah. though, does bring up one thing, which is that, you know, how we approach the mythos is a little different from other games. Um, so first of all, the roots of our mythos uh, approach is all based on public domain material. Okay. So right. a lot of things that you may be used to seeing in other games, 
Um, don't, you know, don't have application. They here. either don't appear or they might have a different name because, as you may or may not be aware, there are some things that are never given names in the source material that were named either by uh, subsequent authors, right, um, in their you know non-public domain works, or yeah. even in even in a couple of cases by Chaosium, right? Yeah, yeah. There's actually a lot of stuff out there where like Chaosium invented a name for something whose appearance was in the, was arguably in the public domain. And yeah. people have not realized that the name is not open, right? Right, right. So we, tried to be, so we tried to be careful about that. But it also means that, you know, some of the assumptions that you may have by reading the, you know, extended, reading from the extended community of Mythos authors, yeah. right, that have kind of developed a consensus among themselves about what things are like, yeah. they're not necessarily going to hold true. In Cthulhu Awakens, That's right? Interesting. And that, so I guess it's sort of a, a word to the wise. And a, you know, if you if you start to get into a debate with your fellow, um, uh, uh, you know, your players around the table, they're like, "No, I heard it was this," and I heard, you know, it, it, yeah. it, it is very likely that you are talking about two things and being right. One of them wrong for this setting. <laughs> one of them, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah and certainly, if you wanna if you wanna incorporate that stuff in your personal game, right? Nobody's gonna nobody's oh. gonna hunt you down. But it is the approach that we've we've chosen so like one example for example uh, what example for example what the hell is happening to me? <laughs> alienation my brain is getting corrupted no um what example is we have this amorphous black colored thing right that is well known um in in mythos stuff right uh and it's and it and we call it a primordial it has a different name in other games, right? Um, but, you know, in addition to having a different name, um, whereas this thing is generally treated as, you know, a shadow amoeba thing that uh, that is in underground spaces and eat pe eats people, we gave it a bit more of a backstory, right? So it is capable of, of duplicating what it touches uh, on, on a kind of genetic level because the backstory that we gave is that it was kind of used as a living piece of lab equipment, right? Uh, for the engineering of novel species, right? So that's something that's not in any kind of Lovecraftian canon, but it's something that we extended from uh, its public domain roots. Got you, got you. Well, that makes sense to me. Now, uh, talk to me about the colonization wars. The colonization war. So basically that's something that is really straight out of, um, you know, the source material. It just yeah. hasn't been organized or framed that way. So one of the things is that the prehistory of the mythos is, includes a lot of outsiders, alien gods, and less godly aliens, uh, all fighting for control of the earth, right? Uh, and... These things are generally, you know, there are, there are a bunch of stories that describe them, right? Sure. And you have something like you have a kind of partial history in At the Mountains of Madness, for example. But, you know, they haven't been bundled, but you know, they haven't been bundled up into one common prehistoric trend necessarily. Sure, sure. And that's what we did. So the colonization wars are basically when all these mythos entities show up and they start fighting each other for territory or whatever other semi-unknowable things they want. Well, so that is my question for you real quick. What is, now do, what is it? What is it about Earth? I mean, of course, because we're here and we're the center of the universe and we're- Oh you know, yeah, Earth. we're totally but, cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. I do not, uh, I don't make a decision about that in the game. I figure that's one of those ultimate secrets that maybe the GM can come up with. Right. It yeah. would just seem like like if it was all about like some kind of widget or the, or right. it, like or whatever, then yeah. it would sort of diminish it. Right. And yeah, make it too like make it too noble. And if it's about humanity, then it contradicts the point of cosmic horror, which is, you know, one of the points of cosmic horror is that we're not necessarily anything special. They don't right? care about it. Yeah. Well, that, that's what I wanted to bring up, because it, to me, it feels like 
something you could really have a lot of fun with trying to act definitive in a particular storyline or adventure yeah with, and only to find out that that is you know uh half myth half uh you know yeah. conspiracy uh or whole out fallout lie you know with mm-hmm. a tinge of truth in some regard but i love yeah. that i mean i feel like it's just a really fun dynamic to play with yeah like one what, what the truth could possibly be is maybe in terms of nothing maybe every world with a potential for life has has these you know has these dudes show up maybe there is a you know maybe there's a different cthulhu for every inhabited planet yeah yeah uh in the universe maybe like cthulhu maybe cthulhu is a transcendental you know well cthulhu is a transcendental ener- entity but maybe cthulhu is so transcendental that you know there's just a copy of cthulhu that tries to take over any world with the pot- potential for life right like we uh, we don't answer those questions for you, although you yeah, can yeah. answer them by going to space, which is possible in the game. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, so that's exciting. Now, <laughs> so, talking about Cthulhu real quick, you know, is yeah. do we have uh, uh, a, a notion as to why why is Cthulhu taking a nap here? Like, what what is that about? Or is he even here, and is it just a dimension doorway to his nap land? Um, well, like, what, like what, I said, we're not we're not super specific about it, right? I you know, know like uh, you know, Cthulhu Cthulhu is you know sleeping it off in in Relia, right? That is yeah. the you know that is the core you know, one of the core things in the mythos, right? Sure. But we don't necessarily know where Relia right. is. Um, we don't necessarily know its complete nature. We don't necessarily know if Cthulhu can be confined to a single body, right? I mean, like Cthulhu, is like you know, lies dead dreaming in Relia. Well, you know, that could be true, but you know, what if Cthulhu is is primarily what we would identify as a psychic entity, and yeah. and the the entity is just this little nub of matter. Right. that it created right. to be its anchor in our reality right that's entirely yeah. possible i don't um, know and i i don't know and i developed the book man so you know and that's and that's why i, I mean malcolm I, I asked the question not because i yeah. i'm gonna, you're going to crack the code and finally find out because malcolm will yeah. spill the truth yeah. it, it's yeah. that because it is unknowable and and there can be so yeah. much known about it and different yeah. facets and all that it's it becomes this another angle another facet of of yeah. telling a yeah. really yeah. phenomenal story yeah we want yeah we kind of we kind of want you to pick up some of the ultimate things right but we yeah. want to put actually stick a stick on that picture for oh yeah Thank you, man. go back to the picture. go back all right so there's one thing i want to note here is that you'll notice cthulhu looks a little different than in most other depictions um and that was a deliberate choice because the idea is we make cthulhu look different so that you would feel free not to stick with lovecraftian canon right um because the idea is that you know um these are ultimately fictions. We, you know, we kind of made it clear that we don't think that the mythos should be bound to any one author or creator. And that includes the, you know, GM, right? So the idea is that we have this kind of, our iconic Cthulhu looks a little different as a, as basically a suggestion. Like, you know, we can make Cthulhu look different. Right, you can make Cthulhu look different. You can make Cthulhu have different motives. Uh, you can change whatever you like. I right? like it. We yeah. provide strong guidance, um, but but it's not a mandate. And this is like it's I. I wouldn't call it like it is a game, for. Not for like it's it's definitely not a purist mythos RPG. But it's also yeah. not one that just uses it as kind of an empty scaffold to throw whatever we want, right? Uh, yeah. It's kind of a it's kind of a dialogue with this like note of I'm going to sound like super arrogant now with this note of cultural production that has sure. been with us for that's been with us for a hundred years, right? Yeah. So you know what that means is uh, is that any work that we do is in dialogue with you know, 
that hundred years of, of cultural production, of stories, of movies, of other RPGs, right? Which is why, again, we didn't design this RPG by pretending that Call of Cthulhu didn't exist, right? Uh, yeah, we exactly. understand that we're having a dialogue in designing the game, and we and and sometimes we have our own takes on different ideas, and sometimes we have new ideas, but we're always having that conversation, and we want the GM to continue that conversation. Yeah, right? yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and then, and that's what I love about this. This is this deeper than just sort of simple set dressing, but also not confining uh, by yeah. you know uh, era or you know, but that it is really uh, it is a conversation with the GM and the players as yeah. well. So yeah, like you know, a lot of this is going to hinge on their definitions and yeah. what makes yeah. a good story. So yeah. our our in as much as we have a prescriptive you know, mandate, we have, there, the, uh, the game mastering chapter is excellent. Um, you know, it, uh, it has, uh, stuff, uh, some of the stuff, uh, was inspired by some of the work that Owen Casey Stevens did for Fancy Age. Uh, there's some stuff by David Castro. There's some stuff by, um, by, you know, uh, folk horror icon, uh, Sean Ingham, um, who I am very lucky to know. Uh, and, you know, our our prescription is really more about running a good game and yeah. also running a game that is inclusive and compassionate, even though we're dealing with the horror genre and we are dealing with a body of work um, founded by a man with terrible opinions. And I love the fact that we can acknowledge the uh, the roots of a thing, but then redeem it through a process of, you know, it, it, it's not even like a homogenization. It is just creating this so that it is successful in the world where you and I live mm -hmm. and uh, and creating just a, a phenomenal set of tools and depth and all of this, you know, just the 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 horror of it all is so distinct and so fun if that's what you're into um and uh i, I mean I, I absolutely love it now listen um we are now looking at six minutes after three um uh pacific time and uh i think that this is a perfect place to sort of pause and uh and you know uh, remind folks that you can pick this up um, by, uh, you can get the PDF today if you make your print pre-order. Um, you can pick up the PDF. Let's say you just want to buy the PDF. That's what you're going to do. I mean, it's cheaper than the book. You can pick that up over at um, uh, Drive Through RPG, or you can pick it up at Green uh, the Green Running Store dot com. Um, uh, or you uh, place your order for the print pre-order, and you get um, uh, the PDF right now for five dollars, which is pretty yes. awesome. Um, yes. Let's talk road just very quickly um, uh, about. Uh, and first of all, yeah, uh, Commando says and cool, and he's not green. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sure, you know, it's it's uh, it's a, a, a new. <laughs> <laughs> um, but David Bolak, you uh, is pondering alienation with the Blue Rose Necro, and I am one hundred percent about that. Uh, absolutely. Um, but so we've got this right now. What are some other things that people can uh, look to the future? Um, uh, to anticipate seeing uh, out in the world as it relates to Cthulhu Awakens? Uh, we have Brickmanship, which is the adventure set of the 1960s. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, um, a World War II set quick start that's currently in layout, uh, also by Sean Ingham. Um, that was fun. I had to look at a lot of old maps of an English village um and uh uh we have cults of the mythos which is basically almost all of the cults and secret societies mentioned in the book get a treatment um and also we have rules for uh for you to sort of run and track the evolution of your own cult with sort of yeah. or uh with this really neat organ a set of organization rules that's uh, bootstrap on the alienation system, and that was by uh, by Steve Kenson. Uh, those systems, but the the cults are by Monty Lynn. And uh, finally, uh, we are currently investigating, planning, noodling uh, a campaign book, oh, but that's okay. going to be further along. 
Oh, and before I forget, of course, uh, the Dreadcrawl zine, uh, that's something that went out to Kickstarter backers as an early reward, um, mm -hmm. right, in PDF and, you know, eventually be available in print. Uh, but Dreadcrawls is a zine and it takes the game and we kind of give it uh, more of an old school, like we look at some old school tools that can work with it or semi old school. And so we have uh, one that's already out, although it's not available to non backers yet called strange places, which yeah. is a, uh, is it's a site and map interior map generator. Um, that includes like non-Euclidean geometry and, you know, uh, and lots of mythos flavor and, oh, and in various, and we have, uh, the text drafts are done for two other issues of Dread Crawls, which Ooh, nice. we will nice. eventually, uh, put through PDF and pod channels. So, uh -huh. you know, stuff is coming. Oh yes. And the GM's kit, um, yeah. That is like, you know, uh, just sort of a breath and a shout away from, uh, from being ready for pre-order. Uh, and that, in, in addition to, you know, the screen and the cards, uh, it also comes with a little book um, detailing a whole bunch. It's called Unexpurgated Texts, and it includes... Um, I forget whether, I think it's 10, is it 10? Yeah, uh, detailed information about 10 uh, sources of eldritch knowledge, right? And, Ooh, you know, lots of them are books. One of them is like a new age zine from the 70s. Uh, one is a cabinet arcade game. Uh, oh, cool, cool. Right, and one is a tattoo. And that's something, where that was a fun one because we basically got... Um, got the green Ronin uh, team together and basically said like, you know, yeah. I basically said, give me some, give me some Eldritch texts. Right. It was great. Uh, yeah. 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 So, so people, uh, a, a bunch of contributors, uh, Chris Primus, um, uh, Crystal Fraser, uh, Steve Kenson, you know, so that's, so there's some fun stuff in there and that's the, just the GM skit folks. That's right. Yeah. But there yeah, you go. Exactly. And so, so tons, uh, I'm glad we were able to go over that list. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's quite, I was going to say expansive. Um, but, uh, the expanse ruined that for me. Um, mm -hmm. but, um, uh, we've got a few questions that I just want to cover real fast. Uh, how long will the five PDF, uh, will the $5 PDF last? Not much longer. So get in there and figure it out. We've also got an actual play coming, um, soon, which will get, um, uh, which will have, uh, Ian is going to be um, Ian Lemke is going to be running it as the GM and will be mm -hmm. uh, the cast that um, it is. <laughs> I just totally spaced the name of it. It is the um, Revelations yeah. of the Bacchae. Thank you, Revelations of the Bacchae. We're uh, we're getting ready to take that live. That's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, it's gonna get it's gonna get hectic. Things have changed a little since we were yeah. last. But but wait, there's more. Oh, go for it. We Thank actually you. did. Um, I actually expanded Ian's uh, notes for the uh, first run of Revelations oh, of the right. Buckeye. That's right. Yeah. Right. Uh, and we added maps and art, and so it's sort of so that is something that is going to go to Kickstarter backers as a thank you for your patience. Um, yeah. But it'll probably be it'll probably be up for sale somewhere as well at some point. Awesome. So it. it's it's kind of done in a streamlined adventure format. Right, because as as any GM, any experienced GM would know, right? You can, while a pre-written adventure, you want lots and lots of detail um, and stuff that you can do. Generally, if you're doing your own stuff, what is it going to be? Like a page of notes before you start, or maybe I'm just lazier than you. Who knows? But <laughs> the uh, the idea is we took Ian's notes and we kind of we didn't build them out all the way into a full adventure, but an experienced a game master uh, can can run it as an adventure, right? With, I like it with a kind of a tighter focus, okay? Than, like than than maybe our traditional adventures. So so that's something that's coming. Nice, uh, yeah, absolutely uh, exciting. And we've got a uh, um, in addition to the actual play, we've got other people out in the world who are working on some actual play stuff. 
uh, around uh, the mythos, Cthulhu Awakens. And mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at a question. Let's see. Duke says, any idea when the core book prints are going to be ready and going out to backers? Uh, I, I'm going to say soon. Um, it, it is, uh, but I'm, and I mean that in the most soonest of the soon ways. Um, go for it. Welcome. Some of the printer yeah. stuff is being some of the printer stuff is being finalized now. That's right. That's right. So um, you know, we believe believe me, we do not want to just have this as a bundle of electrons and nothing else for yeah, much longer. But uh, book. yeah, yeah. Uh, and again, so Janana, we did answer this question. But we're happy to answer it again because I think it's important and people need to hear it. Uh, uh, does the book focus on a specific historical period? And yes, it does, doesn't it? The weird yeah. century, uh, which is what we call the 1920s to the present. Yeah, yep. But we also, you know, we delve into further in the past than that, right? right. Ooh, Duke, you know, I, I don't, I can't speak to whether November will be it, um, but we're looking forward to you visiting up here in Seattle. So um, uh, we'll, we'll keep you posted. And uh, because I'll tell you, um, we want it in your hands as much as you do. Maybe more, I think. Maybe yeah. more. Um, okay, so uh, Malcolm, um, if people want to like uh, engage with you in um, uh, in uh, Cthulhu debate and dialogue, where can they find you? Uh, you can uh, find, you find me, me. usually uh, on the corner up. No, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I pop up in the Age Facebook group. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. I go to the Grad, the G R A A D. Um, and those are usually the most common. Uh, if if you post in the Fantasy Age Reddit, which is sort of the general age Reddit, uh, I may eventually see it. Yep. Nice, fantastic. Uh, and you know, uh, you yeah. can always and you can always email the company, and they will forward it on to me. That's right. And how you do that is you send a note to Let's play at greenronin.com and we will get yeah. to your emails we get just you wouldn't imagine you couldn't imagine it is beyond our human comprehension try to uh put it to um measures and wait to measures how much email we get mm -hmm. <laughs> um but uh but yes in a note in and we will make sure malcolm sees that put a yes. put up yeah for dad signal on any of those oh, spots Jesus. On the internet, and he shall he shall appear in a puff yeah. of lightning and and uh and answer your question um let's see yeah. uh, okay great I'm, I'm looking at some of these comments mm -hmm. uh everybody's saying great thank you we love you uh, hanging out in the grad um uh anything else you'd like to share for folks as we uh as we wind this down you know folks got a whole 16 minutes of extra yeah i'm working i'm i'm working on a game called swords of the shadow planet which i'll eventually talk about Nice, nice. And you can play a dinosaur in it. <laughs> What's going to happen is there's going to be some spillover. Someone will you can, hear this because they're not here right now, and they're going to talk to yeah. us on Mutants Best Friends Monday because yes. they're everybody's very, very much waiting for. Why are people like that? Is the line I have the least to do with? Why are people asking about that on M and M Monday? Like you know, you know come, they're passionate. They're very excited about it. You you yeah. have an impact well, on on the teacher. Well, you can team. well you can play a dinosaur in Swords of the Shadow Planet and. I'm there just going to say random things like that and not usefully answer questions about it for quite some time. It's my How long? Game. I'm not sure. Yeah, Actually, I'm past, I'm, I'm past the halfway point on developing. I've done the uh, systems uh, chapters. It does not use the age system, but it does use a game system that we've published before. Oh, don't, don't. What? Uh, don't tell them. Um, also, no, of course, um, I'm not going to say anything. Are these? Uh, can you play a dinosaur? Are you? Um, are these the uh, guitar playing uh, electric guitar playing dinosaur, or are they the shorter armed ones? Uh, well, they can't play electric guitar because the shadow planet prevents electric guitars from existing. Look at that! You're just too much. Too I've much. I said too yeah. much. You said too too much. Um, yes. But it, and it's, you know, Malcolm, uh, uh, while you say much, it is never enough. We always appreciate you hanging out with us. Um, even even uh, kind of squeeze out an extra 20 minutes there of dialogue. Uh, truly appreciated. We'll have you back again, of course. Um, and uh, uh, looking forward to seeing all the good stuff that's coming out for Cthulhu Awakens. Folks, don't forget to get that $5 PDF. 
All you got to do is print pre-order. That's it. Um, you're going to want the book. You're going to want the PDF and you can do it all right now and start putting yes. it in your own campaigns. I mean, it's almost 300 pages. Like you, you, oh. if you really want that in just PDF, yeah. I mean, come no. on. Come on. This is my big, this, this, this is how I get the sales done. Come on. That's right. Oh, I'm compelled. I'm going to buy one. And I get them. Yeah, it. it's, it's that magnetic tone of voice, isn't it? It is. It is. Uh, it's just, I, I'll buy it. If you stop. Please. Stop. <laughs> All right. All right, friends. Hey, everybody. Thanks again. Hey, do me a quick favor, pals. Um, take a look around you, whatever your, your, um, uh, venue of choice. If you're over on Facebook maybe you're on Twitch, maybe you're, I don't know, maybe you're out at, uh, hanging out at, uh, on Pluto, um, which is actually not Pluto. Um, and you're beaming in, uh, give us a like, uh, make sure you're following us. Um, Share it. Tell a friend. Call your mom. Say, Mom, have you heard of Cthulhu Awakens? <laughs> She'll be so proud. Um, but uh, but yeah, um, it really helps us get the attention that we need from the algorithm because Mercy knows we get a lot of attention from our fans. and We really do appreciate you. Uh, and that's just a one way that you can uh, help us out to spread the word. Um, really, we need, more, we need more machines. We do. We, do. we need we do. more machine fandom. I don't know what they like. I don't either. Well, you know what they like? Um, they like people to engage. Yes, they <laughs> like people to engage. That's what they like. Um, all right. With that, I say thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, we will be back again Monday. Um, there's also another actual play in the works for uh, Mutants and Masterminds, part two of uh, uh, Parker's Manor shenanigans. Um, when last we left, I believe a dragon was flying away, and uh it was it's all very exciting and you can come along for the ride we'll make sure you get that information here shortly um but with that we say goodbye ctfn <laughs> bye